So, we're delighted to have Aisha tonight. Um, Aisha Hamid's work explores contemporary borders and migration, critical race theory, Walter Benjamin, and visual cultures of the Black Atlantic. She's currently the Joint Program Leader in Fine Art and History of Art at Goldsmiths, uh, formerly a research fellow with Forensic Architecture at the Center for Research Architecture. Uh, her publications include contributions to Forensis, the Architecture of Public Truth, We Traveled the Spaceways, which is forthcoming from Duke University Press, Unsound Undead, which is also forthcoming, um, and books including Visual Cultures as Time Travel, which is an edit is it edited? Um, no, no, it's... Uh, co-authored, thank you, <laughs> um, with Henriette Gunkel Sternberg, or it, with Sternberg Press, forthcoming, um, and Futures and Fictions, that one's co-edited with Simon O'Sullivan and Hen Henriette uh, Gunkel, forthcoming. So, uh, Aisha's work has been performed in London, Berlin, Oxford, Edinburgh, Vienna, Leeds, Beirut. Um, we're very lucky to have her back in London tonight. Um, to perform Black Atlantis, a live audiovisual essay that looks at possible afterlives of the Black Atlantic in contemporary illegalized migration at sea, in oceanic environments, through Afrofuturistic dance floors and sound systems, and in outer space. So, let me very welcome. Uh, <laughs> Hi, it's just going to take me a second to uh, get started here. Um, I might be a bit weird because I just finished teaching a class of my own just before this, um, but hopefully not too weird. Actually, you took, you took the first three lines of my talk. Oh, <laughs> um, so for my talk, oh, by the way, hi. It's nice to see you all. Nice to meet you. Um, and nice to see some familiar faces as well. Um, yeah, um, so I'm presenting this project called Black Atlantis, uh, which, as Kristen said, um, oh, yeah, and I want to thank Suhel and Kristen for inviting me because it's, it's always nice to give a talk on your home, home territory which I don't do very often. Um, so it's a project that looks at the Black Atlantic and its afterlives and contemporary legalized migration at sea and oceanic environments through Afrofuturistic dance floors and sound systems and in outer space. Using Walter Benjamin's concept of the dialectical image, uh, I examine how to think through sound, image, water, violence, and history as elements of an active archive and of time travel as a historical method. And a majority of these elements uh, are presented in unlikely pairs, just juxtaposed with one another, and then I trace what kind of residues these pairings leave. So this project actually combines two discourses, uh, Afrofuturism and the Anthropocene. And this follows a comment made by Phil Sternberg, uh, actually in this room uh, a couple years ago, where he said that he had a critique of discourses of Black Atlantic, uh, where he points out that uh, Paul Gilroy's text focuses more on the surface rather than the depths of the ocean. Um, and as a result, the wetness of the ocean is lost, he said. Uh, and thus, its haptic, tac tactile quality is lost. The story of Drexia, which I'll come to in a bit, brings the Black Atlantic below the water with its imaginary of a black Atlantis comprised of former slaves living underwater. What wetness brings back to the table is a sense of the haptic, the sensory, the bodily, and the epidermal. What below the water and Atlantis brings back is the bottom of the sea, the volume of the water, the materiality of the space of the ocean, and other <coughs> protagonists that inhabit the sea. And what Drexia brings into this whole thing is the idea of time travel as a kind of historical method. So today I'm going to talk about the first, that is the bodily, the haptic, in six fragments or juxtapositions. And I'm going to play some music and I'm going to talk about time. In 1840, J.M.W. Turner painted Slavers throwing overboard the dead and dying, typhoon coming on. The sky is red and purple and gold and blue, 
which shifts to frothy white. In the white, a ship's mast faintly recedes. The water is brown. In the right-hand corner is a leg with a manacle around the ankle. There is perhaps a shadow of an arm, but it is hard to tell, as in the water around it are the ghostly maws of fish with puckered mouths and dark eyes and seagulls diving into the water. In 1781, the crew of the English slave ship Zong threw their slaves overboard in a calculus that determined that the insurance money for their death was worth more than the profit gained from selling their lives. As ships crossed the Atlantic, it was a common practice for the captain and crew to jettison cargo in storms. But in a few instances, such as on the Zong, it was slaves who were thrown overboard, an action that raised the issue of whether slaves were seen as legally as property or people, and what constituted an unforeseeable event, what in insurance terms would be defined as an act of God. This was an ambivalence that played out in insurance claims in court, in art and literature, in the fueling of the abolitionist movement through a cast of characters that included the weather, <coughs> slaves on boats, and the boats themselves. So in any account of the slave ship Zong, this image, Turner's slaver, is the image that accompanies it. But as Atlantic historian James Walden points out, in fact, this is not the Zong. There is no image of the Zong nor was there a storm at sea that precipitated the massacre. <coughs> Be that as it may, this painting is a stand-in for the Zong massacre, which has no image and happened on still waters. In this storm, the water, the limbs of slaves, the mouths of hungry fish, and the gawping birds become the ecology of the brown water of the sea. I keep returning to the fact that there was no typhoon, that the storm is an imagined one that has become appended to the lore of this slave ship. How is it possible to append the storm to the massacre aboard the Zong? Or in other words, what is it about storms and what does it mean to imagine one onto history? Storms then become a point of entry to think about how nature in flux is invoked in the socio-historical inquiry. Which, strangely enough, leads us to an electronic band from Detroit called Drexia, whose mythos built through liner notes describe a story where the children born of pregnant slaves thrown overboard were able to adapt to living underwater as they went straight from living in amniotic fluid to ocean water, and so built a black Atlantis called Drexia. And they say in their liner notes, this is from The Quest, which came out in 1997, they say, during the greatest holocaust the world has ever known, pregnant America-bound African slaves were thrown overboard by the thousands during labor for being sick and disruptive cargo. Is it possible that they could have given birth at sea to babies that never needed air? Are Drexians water-breathing, aquatically mutated descendants of those unfortunate victims of human greed? Recent experiments have shown a premature human infant saved from certain death by breathing liquid oxygen through its underdeveloped lungs. So accompanying um, the, these notes in the quest is this four-part map that they had on the sort of facing it. And it's a sort of reimagining of the migration of, um, of slaves and then, and then African Americans in the US. Um, so the first, the first one on the top depicts what they call the slave trade, which is also known as the triangular trade where um, <coughs> ships sailed from Europe down to the west coast of Africa um, with uh, goods that were traded for slaves. And then the slaves were then transported to the United States and the Caribbean uh, and then traded for raw goods that were then sent back to um, Europe on ships um, and then processed in factories, uh, such as in the Midwest here in England. This is called the triangular trade because it forms a kind of a triangle. Uh, and then their second phase um, shows the migration of rural blacks to no northern cities uh, in the 1930s and 1940s from the south uh, going north. And then their, thir their third phase um, of this history is Techno leaves Detroit in 1988. And if you see, there's, there's Detroit, and then there's Techno sort of radiating outwards. 
And then finally, the fourth phase of this history is the journey home. And as you can see that there's these lines radiating uh, from, from the west coast of Africa to North America and to South America. Actually, they're not radiating from. You just see these lines. There's absolutely no direction. They're just these lines connecting these places. So that's fragment one. Two. So I want to start with Walter Benjamin's uh, ninth thesis in, um, in the Theses on the Philosophy of History. And he says, a clay drawing named Angelus Novus shows an angel looking as though he's about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe that keeps piling ruin upon ruin and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. His face is turned toward the past. But a storm is blowing from paradise that has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the, debris, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. So the image that um, he's talk, describing is this drawing, uh, Clay's drawing, which is on your left. Um, but I kind of want to think about what's going on logistically. Like, what exactly is he describing? So here's the angel. The angel, is, its back is towards the future. It sees the past in ruin, and it's helpless to change it. The wind is blowing it forward in time, forward in time, but backwards from where he is facing. Uh, and that wind is progress. And I want to consider a counter image to this which is um, from a film called The Space is the Place, uh, which was made in 1974, uh, and the, to consider a figure called the mirror face. Vibrations are different. It's not like planet Earth. Planet Earth sound of guns, anger, frustration. There was no one to talk to when planet Earth was understand. We set up a colony for black people here. See what they can do on planet all their own without any white people there. They could drink in the beauty of this planet. It would affect their vibration for the better, of course. Another place in the universe, up under different stars. That would be where the ultra destiny would come in. Equation wise, the first thing to do is to consider time as officially ended. We work on the other side of time. We bring them here through either isotope teleportation, transmolecularization. A better still, teleport the whole planet here through music. 
So in this counter image, you see this face that is a mirror that's wearing a cloak of death. You see a reflection of yourself that is because whatever it's looking at, it's reflecting it back, which is another sort of spatio-temporal loop. But you also see from the point of view of the mirror face, the past through Sunra's space forest. The image of the mirror face draws from Maya Deren's Meshes of the Afternoon, which was made in 1943, where where, which is a sequence of images of where a woman slips in and out of a gruesome afternoon dream. In that film, the mirror face, this figure dressed as the Grim Reaper, is menacing. But the mirror face here looks more like a happy witness. The camera cuts to the mirror face repeatedly as Sun Ra talks about the importance of sound and vibrations on this new planet. And when he says, time has officially ended. Three. So this is again from Benjamin's thesis, um, but it looks a little different. Let me read it out to you. The storm is what we call progress. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. <coughs> His face is turned towards the past. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe that keeps <coughs> piling ruin upon ruin and hurls it in front of his feet. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. A clay drawing named Angelus Novus shows an angel looking as though he's about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. So when you reverse the order of the sentences in this thesis, something happens. Suddenly, the very worried angel of history recedes and is replaced by another protagonist, the storm. It pulls an unnamed character into the future while blowing higher and higher the pile of debris into the past. This is the catastrophe. With the storm as the hurtling agent, what all of a sudden becomes tangible is the materiality of the wind. What is accumulated becomes a part of the landscape of the storm and a sedimentation that the angel cannot do anything about. Benjamin does not say here what is being accumulated or where, but consider this. What if history was a storm at sea and its detritus was inextricable from the crashing waves of the pelting water and the bluster? The storm that fuels the mythos of the Zong massacre is a surface symptom of seismic changes below. It is the storm that Benjamin calls progress, the piling of ruin upon ruin that knows no traces, but leaves sediments below. So my counter image uh, to this is a track by Drexia called Digital Tsunami, which I'm now gonna play.
So if you consider the tsunami as a kind of agent like the storm in reverse, it too constitutes a kind of ecstatic blending of forces that are indistinguishable from one another. But this tsunami that you just heard is digital, its power lying in the blending and syncopation of beats. There's a blurring of figure and ground in this song. The beat and the rhythm sort of blend into one another. It starts with one set of beats, one that's whip-like, one that's dissolving. It's, then it comes in with another sound that's a rainy sound. And then a much fourth, much faster sound comes in later. There's something that sounds like something between a siren, a person, or an animal that's underwater or maybe flying through the storm. And it cuts through the beaded curtains of beats. It's echoey. But this sound, too, is part of the same digital indeterminate palette. Four. I wish for other singing. There are two yellow rings, the world and bounce, a blue fork in between. Up and down, you reach the singing yell, where it seems like it, even in the no and yes, every once in a while, with use of huesos and use of colores. But when there's another stick singing that I wish for that he sings, or that I wish I wish for past the cold pragmatics, pray for that little monkey's tilt you run from to edge and bolt the way he kisses money. Sing the box to curve. Contra dance made the camera shake off its mulch and lurch for another quadrant. This is a story about his music. So that's um, a poem by Fred Moten um, that's called I Wish for Other Singing. Uh, and it's from a text a collection called I Ran From It and Was Still In It. And I see this as alluding to another state of indeterminacy, this time on the ship and this time between bodies. There's a set of sonics that comes out of the shared experience of the dehumanization of labor that has its birth in the hold of the slave ship that Stefano Harney and Fred Moten in their book called The Undercommons uh, describe as haptic. They say, and this is the quote, never being on the right side of the Atlantic is an unsettled feeling, the feeling of a thing that unsettles with others. To have been shipped is to have been moved by others, with others, in the hold. Another kind of feeling became common. This form of feeling was not collective, not given to decision, not adhering or reattaching to settlement, nation, state, territory, or historical story. Nor was it repossessed by the group, which could now not feel as one, reunified in time and space. No, when Black Shadow sings, are you feeling the feeling? He's asking about something else. He's asking about a way of feeling through others, a feeling for feeling others, feeling you. This is modernity's insurgent feel. It's inherited caress, it's skin talk, tongue touch, breath speech, hand laugh. This is the feel we might call hapticality. Hapticality, the touch of the undercommons, the interiority of sentiment, the feel that it, what is to come is here. Hapticality, the capacity to feel through others, for others to feel through you, for you to feel them feeling you. This feel of the ship is not regulated, not at least not successfully by a state, a religion, a people, an empire, a piece of land, a totem. Or perhaps we could say these are now recomposed in the wake of the ship. Refuse these things, we first refuse them. In the contained, amongst the contained, lying together in the ship, the boxcar, the prison, the hostel. Skin against epidermalization senses touching. Though forced to touch and be touched, to sense and be sensed in that space of no space, through refuse sentiment, history, and home, we feel for each other. Soul music is a medium of this interiority on the skin. So feel in the feeling is a point of entry to understand the incomprehensible, how music and voice become feel vehicles of this haptic experience of being on board a slave ship. 
This is before a sense of collectivity can be formed, before a language articulated can be formed contra the state. It's a sense of something else, a something else, that arises viscerally beyond language's intelligibility. Its radicality plays out sonically, but also, as he states, at the level of the skin, the pharmaconic surface that is created in the unnameable experience in the hold, but also in the sense of touch that becomes the beginning of what Harney and Moton call an insurgency. It is synesthetic, this haptic experience, the pulling together of the sense of touch with the sense of song. So from this point of view, skin and voice are the sites of contestation and agency. They are literally at the border between techne and the body. And its hapticality comes out and comes into being in the machine of the hold. Its afterlife, Harney and Moton state, comes into the continued experience of slavery on plantations and in prisons. Its song continues in the form of work songs and songs on the chain gang. <coughs> These are soundtracks to work. It paces the gestures of indentured work and the afterlife of the hold. I want to turn to the recording of the songs on a prison chain gang as recorded by Pete Seeger. In Wake Up Dead Man, the folklorist Bruce Jackson describes his 1966 trip with Pete Seeger and his family to a prison in Texas to record the chain gang singing by inmates in the Ellis unit. The area near the prison along along the Trinity and Brazos rivers made for difficult work and had their own songs, as did the act of cutting trees. So each, each form of labor produced a different kind of song to pace it. This was the legacy of plantation work, a way for workers to keep in rhythm so that none of them would be punished for going too slowly. These work songs, so intimately connected with plantation slavery and chain gangs, were in decline at this time as this form of indentured labor also went into decline. As a result, folklorists came up from the north, came down from the north to record this music. but I can't. In this film, it is hard to find the name of even one of these workers or a shot of their face. The voiceover extols the improved prison conditions in this area, and the men working on the chain gang move in formation in spotless white, throwing their skin into relief. There's an industrial, machinic feel to their movement, and yet in their singing, there is an enervation that the viewer that is, I guess, us, feels in the rhythm of song and movement. We see them cutting in trees en masse, and as one tree begins to tumble, an arrhythmia in their singing erupts. Some call out as a tree tips up to the ground, but even before it makes contact, the singing begins anew. It's difficult to see the men singing and working in rhythm in their pristine uniforms for the camera, but the presence of the prison guard mounted on his horse, looking down on them, undermines this. And under the watchful eye of the guard and the camera and Seeger's voiceover, something else happens in this afterlife of the hold, another kind of syncopation of movement that gets the overseer's job done, but also collects from below in the rhythm and singing a powerful force that moves this indentured labor in another direction. Five. All right, so um, to the right, you might see what might be a kind of a familiar image, which is um, uh, Bacchioni's unique forms of continuity in space. Uh, as you know, this is um, a futurist sculpture. 
And one of the characteristics of futurism is, um, or, or within futurist culture, is this desire to capture several movements in one, to capture a movement into the future into a single object or into a single form. Um, in terms of it's in, in terms of how this is politically and socially structured, futurism was interested in sort of restructuring society in the wake of sort of technical advancements. Um, all of this is an inclination in towards the future. As you can see, the figure is leaning forward as well. Um, and what, what I guess what you're supposed to imagine is this is several movements uh, co coalesced into one. And then on your left, uh, you have a sound system uh, in Jamaica. Uh, and what you see here is the piling up of quite a lot of speakers uh, on a truck. Um, and uh, in connection with this, Julian Enriquez, who teaches uh, in media and comms, um, talks about um, a song that I'm going to play now uh, in relation to dub. And that is um, a song by King Tubby that's called uh, Cherry's Dub. <laughs> So, so hopefully that sounded slightly familiar to you. Um, so this, this is a dub track. And often a dub track it was, was sort of um, printed or circulated on the B-side of a 45 single. And the purpose of it, um, as Enriquez would say, would be to exploit an existing work. So this is, if any of you have heard Cherry O' Baby, you know, the UB40 song, this is a dub version of that. And what it is on a kind of commercial level, it's, um, it's sort of made to extract the maximum exchange value of the original song. And this is called, uh, this, this kind of 
approximation is called versioning. It's a kind of way of remembering the original track because what you do is you hear it and you hear the track that it references in your memory. Um, and then the way the song actually, the track actually plays is it comes in waves. It kind of operates in waves. It comes back and forth, comes back to you. Uh, it recedes, the sound recedes. Um, and Enrique says, what you do when you listen to a versioning, when you listen to a dub version of a track, you hear what is not there. The lyrics in the song, uh, the lyrics in the song are evacuated from this version, right? Um, but you fill it in with your own memory. Um, and he discusses this in connection with sound systems, which I just showed this image here, this kind of image here, assemblages, uh, accumulations of sound. So King Tubby, King Tubby's Cherio Baby and the sound system are two forms of assemblage. The piling up of fragments, one on top of the other, whose synthesis is different from a continuous whole. So if you heard the full version of the song, it wouldn't be the same as hearing its dub version. The sound system, too, is also a kind of material and vertical accumulation of sound. What the sound system does is produce what Enriquez calls a sonic dominance, where all your organs in your body are in vibration, because there's so many speakers and the bass is really high. Um, and there's two things I'm thinking about this in terms of this juxtaposition that I've just presented to you. That is a futurist sculpture and a, and a sound system. That both capture movement. One seeks to make movement into the future visible and the other seeks to make memory and history audible. One is the sound of memory and history stretched out. The other is the anticipation of the future that is also stretched out. It's a moving image that's captured into a single image. As opposed to time being made visible in sculpture, and this I'm thinking of this of the, a kind of a futurist manifesto that's drawing from space and time to make the future visible. With dub, history is made audible. And I want to quote from Michael Veal, who wrote a great book about dub. Um, and he says, he links dub to a sort of traumatic witnessing of the violence of transatlantic slavery. And he says, an art form such as dub comes to represent a form of the testimony. Its deconstructed song forms what recalls its deconstructed song forms recalls Gilroy's unfinished form, while its reduction of textual meaning to nonsensical phonemes articulates his idea of the unspeakable historical terrors. In this line of reasoning, the, privilege, the privileging of rupture in dub music comes to symbolize the disruptions in cultural memory and the historical shattering of the existential peace encoded into the cultural nervous system and sublimated into musical sound. Okay, so his evocation of the cultural nervous system takes us into the deep tissue matter of what Enriquez <coughs> called sonic dominance, the organs that are vibrated to the core by the sound system. But it also takes us back to Moton's notion of the haptic feeling the feeling a tactile, pre-collective form of belonging that begins in the hold, and in this instance takes us to the fragmented language and the sonic dominance, which interpolates all your organs. In this conjuncture of the haptic and sonic dominance, I want to play another Drexia track that's called The Black Sea, and consider why Kojo Eshin thinks that Drexia only works in the darkened spaces of the dance floor crowded with bodies.
So the sound is dark and bassy, and then you hear a kind of whippy, higher frequency, and then a few seconds in, you hear a heartbeaty rhythm, uh, or a rhythm that sounds like a heartbeat, and it soon speeds up and sinks, up, sinks us up into a kind of arrhythmia. The whippy sound goes into a higher pitch. It builds and builds and builds until it plateaus. The bassier stuff interpolates your organs. It feels more organy. The higher stuff feels more epidermal. At least I think. Okay. So this is um, this is my last my last slide, my last exposition. Um, and so to the left, uh, what you see is um, the Brooks image. Um, it's a diagram of the Brooks slave ship. Um, it was a hold, it was a storage hold um, that was published in 1788. Uh, Thomas Clarkson, the abolitionist, um, used this image in his campaign against transatlantic slavery. In the 19th century, this image uh, was used to create mass awareness of the condition um, of slaves on board ships and images like this, but this is a very important image um, that spearheaded uh, the abolitionist movement. To the right is an image of migrants on a boat that arrived in the north coast of the Mediterranean. Um, other boats are not as lucky when they sail on this route where more often than not they capsize or they run out of fuel or are turned back. Uh, the state often willfully turns away from the rescuing boats, from rescuing boats like these. Um, migrants on these boats have not been jettisoned from the boats they are sailing on, but their journeys are no less violent or perilous. Um, both ships bear evidence of the epidermal Moton talks about the unavoidable pressing of skin on skin. Um, so this is my last slide, uh, but to be honest, this is actually the slide or the combination of images that sort of spearheaded this project, just trying to think through how to make sense of this historical moment that we're in now where, um, you know, it's almost like a daily, a weekly occurrence of people dying on the Mediterranean um, and it just becomes this catalog of, um, of bodies and then the, the, the closing of the, the, the jungle camp in Calais where we just know these stories of, um, but the stories are an, an accumulation that, um, that just become so huge that they become almost meaningless. Um, but you know, when I started thinking through this project, because I, I, I thought, oh, this is, this kind of language sort of recapitulates the language of the Middle Passage. Um, but to be honest, this comparison is not, I didn't kind of coin this comparison. I mean, both figures on the left and right are constantly comparing um, uh, the Middle Passage or the trade in slaves to migrants. And both, uh, both sides are sort of calling attention to this. So the Italian Prime Minister, Matteo Renzi, um, sort of blame, sort of points to the, 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 the passage of, of migrants on ships and blames the evil slave traffickers, the evil traffickers who are responsible for taking these hapless people onto these boats, you know, ignoring the agency of people who are choosing to leave, um, no, to leave, where, leave certain um, political situations, uh, pl places which are being completely destroyed. Um, and on the right, oh, sorry, and on the left, um, The whole, the, the conditions on board the ships, the kind of things they're consuming, um, the, the way in which people are starving and suffocating on board these tiny, tiny ships that are overcrowded, um, the comparison to the Middle Passage and the conditions on board ships like the Brooks um, are also made as well. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, thank you.
but those of you that have to go, I know this is a little bit of a later time. Um, okay. So we're just going to have, we've got about a half an hour more um, for the conversation. Um, I've got three questions that I want to ask, but I don't want to hog the time. Um, but I'll ask the three, and then if you guys want to think about what questions you have, and then the microphone's going to go around, and, and you can ask those. Um, so I'll try to make mine um, relatively brief. But I just want to say again, thank you so much. Um, I think it's, um, well, the first question might relate to why I'm, I'm so kind of um, enthralled by, um, by the presentation, and it has to do with the form of the audiovisual essay. Right. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about about that form and the work it's doing um, in relation to your research. Right. Um, well, can you guys hear me? I, I feel I feel dodgy with this mic. Um, okay. I also feel like this. I, I know feel this like is weird. this is such yeah. a weird <laughs> format. Maybe you guys are used to it. I I feel really weird here. Um, so. The audiovisual essay is actually uh, a term that I picked up from a friend of mine who, well, not exactly, but a friend of mine uh, named Lawrence Abu Hamdan, who's an artist and also a private ear. He does a lot of work in um, audio ear. forensics. <laughs> and he does a, a lecture performance that he calls a live, oh, hey, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, he does a, uh, a lecture performance that's called a live audio essay. Okay. Um, and then I, and then we were chatting. He said, "I don't know why I don't call it a live audio visual essay." But I guess for me, um, what I really liked about his term and why I expanded it into my my own work is um, there's a kind of like instead of sort of pushing away the academic or seeing it as like not important. I think there's a kind of like earnestness to it um, in terms of how I cite. I mean, actually, I'm doing this, um, a performance on like in a few weeks in November. Uh, and it's going to, I'm working with an um, electronic musician named Tom Hurst. Um, and we're doing a much more integrated sound mm -hmm. and uh, image thing. But we're still going to be working with a bibliography. So I think that's really yeah. important to, to, the, to the project to have like citation to, to cite. Mm, yeah, to get the references. In. And it was just interesting, particularly the last track that you played. I don't know, I saw a few feet kind of bobbling around, but you know, it, it was just interesting to, to think about, you know, what what difference it makes to be on the dance floor as compared to like, because I was trying to think about music, which is a very different experience. Um, yeah, uh, so I thought that, you know, just to bring that into this context and then think around um, that. Um, so, okay, I'll go on to my second question. Um, and it, it has to do, I was lucky enough to have a, a copy of a, another lecture that, that you'd done that had a snippet of um, some of this and lots of this new new stuff. But it, it has to do with the um, the moment you're talking about the storm mm -hmm. um, and the, the incredibly clever kind of um, uh, flip of that uh, Walter Benjamin um, fragment. Um, and then you move into this idea of the storm as a kind of agent. Um, and then I'm going to quote you. Um, you said, um, uh, <laughs> moving into the tsunami in the digital, there's a blurring of figure and ground uh, of this song. Beats and rhythms blend into one another. Um, I, I just, I love this line. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, so the blurring of figure and ground and this idea of the, the storm as an agent, to me suggests something about a, a kind of political agency that's mm. figureless. Um, mm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the implications of what that might mean, particularly as one of the things about this series is around identity. Right. Um, so, yeah. Um, let me think. I guess, I guess a, par a part of trying to articulate that, I really feel like you can't hear me. I feel like I can only hear me, but can you I'm just going to keep talking. Um, <laughs> these mics are so weird. Um, sorry, sorry. We could so, talk. Uh, is um, that's the kind of like Afrofuturism and Anthropocene moment that I'm trying to kind of very loosely and I'm sort of embarrassed because there's some much more sort of Anthropocene knowledgeable people in the room. But um, but just to sort of think about the idea of um, the environment having a kind of agency. And so it's not, I guess the challenge is also to try to think about um, the storm and the ocean as figures as well, right? Or like, 
I guess when figure and ground collapse and then into one another, then who's the agent? Is I always come back to that image, that Goya image that mm -hmm. um, Michelle Fair talked about in the natural contrast, mm -hmm. where there's these two um, dualists mm -hmm. who are sword fighting, uh, and there it's, it draws from. I, I hope none of my students are here because I just talked about it a few weeks ago. But anyways. Um, while they're dueling, they're slowly sinking into the quicksand. So they're not noticing it, but the, yeah. the, they're, they're sinking into the ground, and the ground is also uh -huh. an agent, yeah. but not a figure, a figure as well. I don't know. I have That's to think about that. An yeah. agent and not a figure. Yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, it just pulls up some really interesting um, things. Okay, my last question, and then um, the microphone will go around. Um, and this one has to do a bit with, um, the Black Atlantis, also a, a number of the other things that um, you were bringing up, and it has to do with um, w whether or not these are metaphors or not. Right. For you, um, I know we went over this, and now <laughs> I'm like, oh, wh what's my answer to that question? Um, well, I, no, I kind of feel like, okay, so I. When I did my PhD, I did it on the Middle Passage. It was a Benjaminian reading of the Middle Passage. And then I did my postdoc on contemporary Mediterranean migration. Mm -hmm. And then actually, to, to be honest, when I found Grexia, I was like, this is a method. This yes. is a way to yeah. sort of think through um, these two moments. And I don't feel like it should be a metaphor. Like, I really want it to not be a metaphor. I want it to be a very literal read. So in, like, there's passages that you read that I've actually really carefully read through tracks mm -hmm. of um, their songs and be like, OK. They have this underwater, like there's this album there, it's called Neptune's Lair, mm -hmm. and um, all the tracks are named after like this substance that they find at the bottom of the sea mm -hmm. that allows for, I don't know, different forms of energy in life. So I just, I'm like, well, okay, life on the surface is like, of the earth is, is very difficult right now um, mm -hmm. for all kinds of political reasons, all like <coughs> climactically it's difficult. So let's just think through these possibilities, like they're her because they're in the face of like such horrific um, political events mm. and climactic and environmental events. Um, yeah. Mm. So they're kind of doing work, um, or again, kind of a method, a way of doing it. Um, well, when you're, when you're struck with like all these unimaginable catastrophes that we're facing right now, which we, which we are, um, then you have to kind of go into the unimaginables to think of. I, so I think about it quite seriously, actually. Yeah. 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 OK, um, Ruth's going to help. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> I'm seeing people I know in the audience. Thanks, Aisha, for the, uh, for the, I thought it was, it was an amazing talk about how I'm talking about the future and how I'm using the dialectical image. Yeah, I mean, I mean how, how are you, as, as, an, as an academic, how do you work with this material and bring it together in a coherent way yeah. that is an ideology? Ah, but you see, the thing is, is I don't think it's coherent. Like, I think the whole point <laughs> is that it's not coherent and it's not meant to be. So to me, that, no, 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 but yeah, I think that that's kind of a point, because like, um, when I, so this project's sort of taken on a lot of different forms, and it's very, it's actually very, it was very hard to write it. It's hard, hard to make a script out of it, because I kind of don't want to resolve things. Like, mm. to me, as soon as I resolve a juxtaposition, it just flattens out. Um, and if there's something kind of weird, mm. some kind of weirdness that remains in that juxtaposition, mm. that, that's, to me, quite yeah. good. Um, I mean, it kind of reminds me of that 
fantastic that Benjamin talks about in the storyteller when he talks about that story of Herodot that Herodotus' story about the king. Should I just tell the story? It's like uh, the yeah, king. Yeah, the way you see it, uh, the demise of death and all that stuff. Right? Well, he's just basically, he, he's captured and all these people are, there's a procession of people who walk by him, are paraded by him, and he sees his family, he sees whoever, and then he sees, ah, oh, who does he see? Maybe one of his slaves? I don't know. Be, so, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thanks, Mary Louise. Um, so, and, and he bursts into tears. And the whole point of the power of the story, according to Benjamin, is that he doesn't explain it. So, I mean, that's a bit exalted for me to sort of compare. My, but as a method, that's kind of what I'm trying to do, is just to compare things and not resolve it into any kind of coherence. Because I don't think it coheres into an argument, actually. Um, and I think the future, I can't really make a statement about the future in it either, because I think the future is a tool and a trope that's not just like the future is being used to inflect the present or the future is this utopian repository uh, to kind of think about as a sort of a transformation of the present, like it's a kind of a combination and it comes up in different forms and would multiply and serve different purposes, if that makes sense. So Sun Ra, I'm bringing up Sun Ra, Sun Ra, but I'm bringing up, I think, I think maybe the, the mirror face is quite a good figure for that because the, the, the mirror face just doesn't resolve itself at all. It just keeps on reflecting things and it's not scary and... Um, as opposed to the individual figure, right? Mm. Yes, exactly. Why is that the outline? Um, well, they're more of a juxtaposition than an opposition. That's sort of how I describe it. Are there other questions? Um, we've got one here and here. And Hi. Um, I'm from the art form, the architect that you mentioned earlier, and I know the subject has the red triangle. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to see your work on that. And then, like, in addition to that, I was um, wondering if you could maybe more like intensively plants and tell us a little bit about the like and resource method and how you got like for the process and how you how these materials. <laughs> Just an easy, an easy question. Um, I uh, well, f forensic oceanology was a very labor-intensive project that was run by uh, Lorenzo Pattani and Charles Heller, and. For a few weeks, I helped them look up some data, but I'm just sort of on the margins, very admiring of their work. But I am very influenced by the kind of work that they, they were doing on the Mediterranean, absolutely. Um, um, and so I'm working on this. So this is a project. And then I'm working on another project, which came out of my work with forensic architecture, which is on the practice of um, this migrant practice of destroying fingerprints. Um, and so, which was sort of not as common now, but maybe about 10 years ago, migrants um, would try to remove their fingerprints so that they could evade detection <coughs> under uh, what's called the Eurodac, which is a centralized repository of fingerprints. So if you were caught and you'd be fingerprinted, you'd be <coughs> deported to the country um, that you first entered Europe in. Um, but I um, uh, uh, um, was interested in how uh, the landscape, like how, the skin acted as a kind of terrain, I guess, um, and that once it's broken, what that meant. Also, the Sisyphean ta like task of like destroying and regrowing fingerprints. So that that project um, is now a film um, that I'm actually screening at the Bartlett. Uh, That's brilliant. Yeah, and um, also a lecture performance as well. Um, Sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> See, I knew it was going to happen. Uh, where should I, where should I, what did you stop hearing? Where did you, at what point did you stop hearing me? No, really, it was just fading. Okay. <laughs> so, where, but at what point did, did you lose it? Well, it was just for the project, it was made into a film. Okay, so it was made into a film, and then, and then into a, le a performance lecture, um, and, um, yeah, it's just ongoing. It's, these are the two projects, but I, I also sort of see them really influencing each other as well because the kind of the, the urgency for me with this project is to try to think through uh, contemporary migration. Sorry, you asked me the question. <laughs> um, we had a question back here. 
And just so we know, are there other questions coming up? Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, my question is kind of coming back to the kind of a follow up mm -hmm. on the identity thing, like uh -huh. regarding the idea of like the storm as the agent, and then the anthropocene, uh, kind of like, like uh, the environment around it. But also, like, I'm kind of like uh, really interested in the way you explore this like uh, transdisciplinarity because it's all somehow embodied. Like you're like you're like doing this juxtaposition when you're doing it through embodiment. So it's kind of like if the images that represents or the like or the or the make sense through the body, like yeah. through this kind of like more uh, uh, like not really like in the mental sphere, but like that kind of like you know that has to twist twisted and on the body. Yeah. And then I was wondering like how how would you relate like this idea of like Anthropocene and the storm as an agent, but also the embodiment of the storm as like as as the the actual result of the agency itself? Because I remember when we were having demonstrations in Brazil and kind of like this like bringing things whatever in 2013, there was a really nice uh, interview that later on became an article by like this uh, Brazilian philosopher Peter Peter Paul Sova, mm -hmm. where he was like kind of like linking the demonstration and then the reporter came to one of the like uh, the people in the demonstration and said like, oh who are you? Like who are you? Like what are you fighting for? And then the guy came to the, to the reporter and said, uh, write that down, I'm nobody. Mm -hmm. But then again the like the whole country was like in the storm. Yeah. Like, basically like and I, I think this kind of like this process of like the storm embodied, like being embodied as like a, as this kind of like violent act through the body, but like faceless or like identity. Like. Mm -hmm. And I could kind of like somehow see this like in your research, even like like using sound because sound is kind of like the less representative like medium. I mean, in terms of like uh, representation for this meaning. Mm -hmm. And then coming to this picture. Yeah. I don't know if I made a, a, a no, question. No, no, that was really interesting. I mean, I guess, um, so the project right now is in, it's, it's in three parts. And the first part, like the one that I, I that this is the first part, which is focusing on bodies. And then the second part focuses on earthquakes and the, the, the bottom of the sea stuff. That was the stuff that you read. Um, and then the third part is, um, which I'm working on right now, is on what people would eat, like ecologies, like what things eat each other, um, uh, what would what would Adrexian live off of, and sort of thinking about it in the most dystopian and the most sort of utopian way. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, definitely like this idea of the crowd uh, being like a force, um, I mean, it's dangerous, that one, because there's a kind of 19th century sort of discourse, like when the, with the kind of growth of the modern city, um, there's this whole discourse about how, this, how the crowd was, was like a storm or like the sea. Victor Hugo wrote about this, and um, I think you, often it's used in a way to sort of dismiss a collectivity. So there's like the crowd, and then there's the collectivity. And the way that these natural forces are usually used to sort of Sort of dismiss it is through that, but I think what you're saying is much much more interesting. It's like actually reading, reading the reading identity or reading the figure after the fact of the storm being an agent. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There was one. Yes. Um, Do you want to project if that's easier? Yeah, maybe just yeah. shout <laughs> it out. That's great. Um,
found the I found the you know the experience interesting and I got paid for it kind of thing. Mm. Um, and that and the friends of mine told me that the same guy um, just got funding to do a new project which will come in like a year or two, which is about the migrant crisis to try and to to to, to re um, or refugee crisis. I mean, uh -huh. yeah, I guess it's different stages as well. Like my yeah, yeah, yeah. refugees, but um, yeah, to to stage like a, a prison, yeah, a prison place where they are, yeah, where they are kept. Which you know, you can just go to Greece and see them basically. Yeah. But he's going to get funding to, to do it and tour that and for people to go around there and experience that. Um, and yeah, so we had this like four hour massive like ah run. <laughs> Fair well, enough. How can you get funding for that? Who mm -hmm. are these people? Mm -hmm. um, and and this, this kind of like thing about what's like for me also something that like I try to push away from, but it's also inevitable is um, the mainstream and the mainstream image mm -hmm. and, and what is being portrayed. And um, and those two images for me are like very much, you know, like one of them is, one of them <coughs> knows that image on the right. Mm -hmm. Maybe not everyone knows that image on the left. Um, and and yeah, basically. That, that sounds appalling. Sorry, not, not, not the compliment. Thank you for the compliment. Um, uh, but more just the, you know, this idea of restaging these camps, I guess. Um, I guess, like, for me, so I'm, I'm not a sound person. I'm just, like, you know, a visual. I'm, I'm like a visual guy. So when I started this project, you know, I, um, for me, it was, like, really important that Drexia, they were, they were, they were musicians, electronic musicians, and... Yeah. Uh, like, so you brought up this thing about figure and ground, like the only way I could make sense of what I was listening to was through visual tropes, such as figure and ground. Um, and to me, I think, like personally, me, like using Drexia and using music was really important because it sort of taught me how to listen to things in a different way um, and to articulate it in the context of all these things that can't be really put into words. Um, and so um, it felt it felt like beca because okay so Drexia is that so they have all these liner notes and you know there's a lot to be said about it and they they're written a lot um, within the discourse of Afrofuturism but that's just their side thing I mean really what they're doing is the music right so it's kind of like well and then they're not using lyrics or anything so mm -hmm. then it's just an like exercise in trying to hear what they're what they're doing um, and then do and then collectively you know when I first started doing like I've done a f few different versions of this talk. I used to be really nervous about playing an entire track mm. because I didn't try, I thought, oh, this is really boring or this is an imposition. And then I just sort of realized that actually we're all in this room together <coughs> hearing a track and the track just deserves to be heard and it's different in every different room. And to me, that's a kind of, for me, a pedagog, like, like mm. I learned from doing that. So I don't know if that answers your question, mm. but to me, yeah. that. Well, And we've probably got time for these two questions. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I missed the whole lecture. Because <laughs> I, 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 I think Harry did it six thirty, so I missed it. But oh. I'm an expert on, on music and Brexit because I covered. I, I met the artist in Detroit. Wow. So oh, I amazing. met Gerald's brother. Uh, sorry, I met James's brother who passed away. But I also met Gerald Mitchell. And so I know you actually met Gerald Mitchell because he's got a group called Double Effect. Mm -hmm. um, I also just on a project exploring the same thing. I know it's probably by arts council, but my project was called Bitch Black, as in bitch E D black, which is okay. the same sort of musical connotation. And I explored why children with a make that musical of Big GMC from the Dr. Les Box from his name. Oh, fantastic. And I, so I went to interview him and I was funded by Inver UK the Arts Council to do it. So my line is is that I'm a musician. I make electronic music, so mm -hmm. I was I could fill you in a little bit of oh, the music great. side. <laughs> Because uh, you know, the guy that put all the records out in Detroit is a guy from Mike Banks, and the label's called Underground Resistance, but it's a yeah, publishing yeah. company called Hyper Hyperspace Publishing, so we could talk about La Dolda and Wave Junkers and all the little words and phrases within the world of Brexit. So, and I'm just to get going, I missed the whole of it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like the best, that's a great comment. You uh, should speak to Gerald. Gerald, I think he lives in Berlin now. Okay. This group's called Doppler Effect, and he'll uh, talk to you. 
<laughs> okay, well, great, thank you. I just want to know how you feel. Oh. If you would be the, we well, should really reach out to you. I don't know yeah. what happens, we're really trying to adjust. Because change doesn't address your thing anymore. No, 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 because, no, yeah. You know, it's part of the system. Great, great, thank you, thank you. And do you need the mic, or you want to shout? I just, yeah. yeah, great. Um, Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, a part of how and, this and if you can, oh. sorry, push the mic. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> good. Yeah. Okay. Just, just tell me if I if I drift because it's hard to think and hold at the same time. <laughs> it's a weird combination. Um, well, basically, um, one reason why the project took the form that it did is that there's so many balls in the air. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many things that I'm trying to address, um, and I keep on try doing it in waves. So, uh, for me, climate change. I'm trying to address it a bit more in this underwater, it's called, this piece is called The End of Eating Everything, which is uh, taken from a Wangechi Mutu video. Um, but it's sort of thinking about the underwater environment um, and then thinking about like that one degree temperature rise. Um, um, and it is this thing because uh, it's this crisis that everybody, like there's so much complicity, I mean, you know, like, the Anthropocene discourse has also been so much more refined now. So now we talk about the, uh, you know, the plantation scene or the capitalist scene, um, the you know Donna, Donna Haraway's Cthulhu, which is all kind of quite good and kind of um, in a way makes more precise uh, the agents, and I think that makes at some point more precise what the what to do. Um, but I think the what to do is still like so the scale of it is so large. Um, but yeah, I mean, just like in a very pragmatic way, the um, uh, this piece that I'm doing now is trying to address it. Because even like with this with this one that you've seen, like there's not as much about uh, Mediterranean migration as there are in, in other parts of the project. It's just trying to keep everything up in the air. That's great. Um, I just want to draw back into the room a comment that came out of one of the comments. Um, and it was the idea of not replicating I thought that was really interesting, and it kind of brings back me back to your method, um, which to me just doesn't replicate. Like holding these things, you know, in the same space, it, it's doing something completely different than replication. It's thinking, and it's getting us to kind of think and feel um, these different issues. So I'm just kind of bringing that back in because I think that you, I think you said it's not art when it's replicating, and I thought, um, but I'd, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you to Aisha, and can we give her another round? Um, <laughs>